All right, we are in uh, week seven of our Endure First Peter sermon series. Uh, so it took us you know, six weeks to get through a couple chapters. We are just chugging along here. Would you flip with me to First Peter chapter three? First Peter chapter three. If you don't have a Bible, the tables in the back should have Bibles on them. That's our gift to you. We want you to have that and, and keep that. First Peter chapter three. We're gonna be in verses one through seven today. And at Story Church, it's our custom because we believe the word is from God and about God. We want to honor and revere his voice. So if you are willing and able, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct... Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry and the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening." Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. This is the word of the Lord. Go ahead and have a seat. Uh, My daughter has this big sketchbook in it, and inside this sketchbook, there's a bunch of um, figures of of little girls, and they're all blank, and it's just like a bunch of pages of that. And the whole point of this book is that Peyton is supposed to take those figures and become the fashion designer for them. Uh, So there's different hairstyles and dresses and skirts and tank tops and earrings and makeup and things that I don't know what they're called, but I know what they look like. And... um, She's just really into fashion design stuff. And now, now here's the deal. I'm afraid many of us treat Christianity the same way my daughter treats that sketchbook. That God has given us the basic outline for how we should live, but we have freedom to design it the way we want to. We have a designer Christianity, and in this case, we are the designers, not God. But the truth of the matter is, is that God is the designer, and he has given us not a sketchbook, but a finished work. And we all, if we claim Christ, are to be under his lordship with a glad-hearted obedience. You see, the Lord does not run a democracy. He decides we obey. His word is the authority, the end. Now, here's where that becomes challenging. Every one of us have been shaped both consciously and subconsciously in a particular time, place, socioeconomic status, family of origin, so on and so forth. And so oftentimes we approach and read the scripture through those lenses and we become uh, like the serpent in the garden saying, did God really say? Did God really say, and we get to twist and pervert and change the word of God, but here's the truth. We are not privileged enough, smart enough, loving enough, holy enough, or wise enough to take the authoritative word of God and make it conform to our current realities or best practices. Instead, you and I, our calling is to submit to him and his word. It has the authority. I say that because when we read 1 Peter 3, 1 through 7, many of us scoff and bristle and we accuse the word of God of being outdated. Again, we twist it, we pervert it, we water it down, and we create a designer faith. And designer faith never leads to flourishing. When we read the word of God, hear me, it should assault our feeble modernity. It should assault what we think is the right way because we are sinners and our hearts are deceitful. The word of God should take us back and it should lead us to repentance, to conformity and to transformation. And this passage is not a passage meant to beat down. Instead, like everything else in God's word, it is a beautiful passage. And when obeyed, it is meant to lead to beautiful things and flourishing in the way of Jesus. Just consider for a second with me, the last three weeks have dealt with submission, right? Be subject to is the same phrase as submit. Now, who is Peter writing to? Two weeks ago, Nathan talked about it. In the first week, he is addressing the citizens, not the government. Last week, he is addressing the servants, 
not the masters. This week, he spends six verses on women and one verse on men. This is a stunning reversal for how the ancient world operated. Why? You will not, I searched a lot this week, you will not find one single popular work from the ancient world that addressed citizens, not governments, addressed servants, not masters, and addressed women primarily, and then men. This is a stunning reversal. Why? Because those three categories, citizens, servants, and women, in the ancient world were considered subhuman, brutish, uneducated, and not worth the ink. It is only in God's word where God looks at male and female, man and wife, and says, very good. As Josh prayed before service, marriage is one of the only institutions that was in place before the fall. God declares men and women and the marital union as very good. It is only in God's word where he says both citizens and governing authorities are very important, where servants and masters are on equal footing. You see, Peter here, our modern sensibilities might read this and say, man, he's slamming women. He is not. He is dignifying women in ways that were utterly unheard of in the ancient world. As a matter of fact, in verse 7, look there with me. When addressing the husbands, halfway through, Peter says this, since they, who's they, are wives, are heirs with you of the grace of life. Co-equal heirs of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Co-equal vessels of the Holy Spirit of God. Co-equal in value in the kingdom of God. Which is why Peter says to men, honor your wives. You see, ancient women were not worthy of honor. Adultery in the ancient Roman Empire for men was encouraged. It was sought after. For women, if you committed adultery, you would be sentenced to death. It is in biblical Christianity where God looks at the men and says, honor your wives by being faithful. So the underlying sense here is that men and women are co-equal in their value, but distinct in their roles. And this is a deeply countercultural passage, which is why I've entitled this sermon, Countercultural Marriage. Countercultural Marriage. Now, here's a caveat. If you're single, if you're unmarried, if you're separated, divorced, widowed, wherever you find yourself today, um, while this text is addressed to husbands and wives, and that's who I will primarily be addressing, this is not an out for anyone. Men, when we read verse 7, we should say, regardless of our marital situation, that's the man I want to become. Women, when you read the first six verses, you should say, that's the type of woman I want to become. We should, all of us, aspire to embody these things here on the pages of God's scriptures, and we should all humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God and say, that's who I want to become by the grace of God. So counter-cultural marriage. All right? Everyone's with me, right? Okay. Here's the outline. Counter-cultural wives... We'll talk about first countercultural husbands, second, and then third, we'll talk about principles for how to live out countercultural marriages. Now, last week I went 55 minutes. I'm going to try not to do that today, so keep me accountable to that. Um, first point countercultural wives. So, Peter begins chapter three with the word likewise. Likewise, so what's he, what he's doing there is connecting the same train of thought he's been in for the previous two sections of First Peter 2. And, and so here's how it's working. He is getting really broad in submission when he's talking about citizens obey the government. And then he gets a little more narrow when he says, servants, obey your masters and submit to your masters. And now he's getting extremely narrow and talking about husband, or wives, submit to your husbands. Now here's what's going on. The ability to submit is getting more intimate, right? You are most intimate with your husband, women in the room, you are most intimate with your husband, therefore your submission to your husband should be the highest. Okay, so as the, as the scope narrows, the level of submission increases. And what, what, is, what does he say here? Verse one, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husband's so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. Okay, so again, that word be subject is the same word as submission. But it appears that Peter is addressing two categories of people here. He says, so that even if some do not obey the word. So he is saying, 
some of you wives are married to unbelieving husbands. So he's going to speak to them, but that doesn't mean he leaves out wives married to believing husbands. This is all-encompassing. But it's important that Peter addresses wives married to unbelieving husbands because in the ancient Greek and Roman world, there was something um, called household codes. You may have heard of these, maybe not. For religion, when it came to wives in these ancient household codes, here's how it went. Listen to Plutarch. A wife should not acquire her own friends, but should make her husband's friends her own. The gods are the first and most significant friends. For this reason, it is proper for a wife to recognize only the gods whom her husband worships. Okay? So Peter is saying, women, some of you are married to unbelieving husbands, and these household codes are saying, you can't worship God, you have to worship these false gods because your husband gets to declare that. And Peter's just blowing that paradigm up and saying, in Christianity, there is no such thing as dual allegiance. You worship the triune God of the Bible alone, and yet somehow in the tension, you are to simultaneously submit to your husband in his leadership, which teaches us that submission is never blind obedience. Do you hear me? Submission is never blind obedience. Okay, again, two weeks ago, Nathan talked about that. Go back and listen to that sermon to to hear that. So, So what Peter is saying essentially to these wives is this. A wife does not have to submit to a demand that the Bible forbids or to a prohibition that the Bible commands. Okay, so ladies in the room that are married, if your husband is telling you to do something that God says not to do, if he says, hey, you need to cheat and you need to lie and you need to steal, you gladly, because of your God-given rights, say, no, I'm not going to do that thing. Submission is not blind obedience. In the same way, if your husband is telling you, hey, you can't do that, and it's something God says to do, you again gladly say, I am not going to submit to that. If your husband says, you can't gather with the church, you can't serve, you can't give, you can't read your Bible, you can't catechize our children, you just say to him, "Mm -mm, no, I am primarily in submission to the God of the universe and his word. In other words, women... If your husbands are asking you to do something that forsakes your faith, do not do that thing. The same goes for our governing authorities and our masters. But so far as your husbands are not asking you to abandon your faith, submission is a beautiful thing in God's design. So long as your husband is leading you in the way of the Lord, submission is a beautiful thing. Now, here's a note. He says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Here's what that teaches us. Every woman everywhere is not in submission to every man everywhere. Okay? So so I'll use my wife as an example. Katie is in submission to me as her husband, She is in submission to her bosses at work, and she is in submission to the elders of this church, but, and I'll pick on Josh, she is not in submission to Josh. (laughs) That is not her husband. In the same way, Kristen is not in submission to me as her husband. I am not her husband. I am Katie's husband. Right? Where this gets perverted is when women hear I have to submit to every dude in this room? No, not in the marital union. You are in submission to your husband and your husband alone so long as he is leading you in the way of the Lord. Husbands, this should take us back for a second. Are you leading your home in the way of the Lord? Are you moving your wife closer to Jesus? Are you creating obstacles to her following Jesus? We should pause for a second and consider those things. So wives, submit to your husbands. Now, here's what submission is not, ladies. Submission is not agreeing with everything your husband says. Submission is not turning your brain and words off in the middle of discussion. Submission is not avoiding trying to see your husband change to look more like Jesus. 
Submission is not putting the will of your husband ahead of the will of Jesus. Submission is not consistently and constantly acting out of fear. Women, you have access to God the Father through Jesus Christ, not through your husbands. Submission is none of those things. So again, how how does this work out for Katie and I? Um, Let's say we're we're kind of at a roadblock with what are we going to do with our kids? We'll we'll use schooling as an example, all right? What are we going to do for schooling for Peyton and Owen? And Katie and I, it's not just like I come in and I say, this is what we're doing, end of story. We're going to have discussion about those things. Why? She spends far more time with our kids than I do. She knows our kids far more intimately than I do. She knows those needs far more clearly than I do. So what are we going to do? We're going to have a robust discussion around, hey, what are the needs of our children? What should we do with school? How does that look? Now, in the instance that we do come to a roadblock after all of that, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say, I think this is the way we should go. And she's going to say, I'll submit to you in that because I know you have my best interests and our kids' best interests in mind. If I didn't, she would gladly just say, no, we're not doing that thing. This is how it works out, guys. It's not blind obedience. So wives, be subject to your husbands so long as they're leading you in the way of the Lord. And then he says, why do we do that? Why? Why? So that those husbands, those unbelieving husbands, may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Here's what, uh, what Peter is essentially saying with that. You guys remember back in elementary school when you did show and tell? Right? That's what he's telling wives to do. Show and tell the gospel in your marriage relationship. As you tell your husband of the good news of the gospel, the forgiveness that Jesus has given you, the mercy he has extended to you, the work he did on your behalf on his cross. You tell your husband these things, but you don't just tell, you also show your husband the gospel with your conduct. You extend the same forgiveness to your husband that he was extended in Christ. You, or, you were extended in Christ. You show your husband the same mercy and grace that Jesus has shown you, right? When he is on your nerves, it's not an excuse to dip out. Why? Because we show the good news of the gospel in our marriage. Um, I'm going to read something, and this is from the Bible, okay? Don't get mad at me. Proverbs 21. It is better to live in a desert land than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. Here's what that means, guys. It is better to go live in Barstow than it is to be with a nag. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm not, that's not a joke. I'm not intending to make you laugh. A countercultural wife is not a nag, is not passive aggressive, is not manipulative right? You can't nag your husband into believing the gospel. You can't nag your husband into growing in the gospel. Instead, wives, verse two, you are to be respectful and pure in conduct. Yeah, we don't nag, we respect. We are not fretful and quarrelsome. We are pure in our conduct. Uh, St. Augustine Uh, describes how his own mother, Monica, won his pagan father to Christ like this. She served her husband, show and tell the gospel, and did all she could to win him for you, speaking to him of you by her conduct, by which you made her beautiful. Finally, when her husband was at the end of his earthly span, she gained him for you. She did not nag. She showed and told told the gospel, not told. Ed Clowney says this, Christian wives can have an important part in the church's witness. That witness may not be easy. Their husbands have resisted the claim of the gospel. They may ridicule the message and insult their wives. So strong may there be their hostility that it is no longer possible for their wives to speak of the Lord to them. Even then, the Christian wife must not despair. She still possesses a mighty weapon for winning her husband to the faith. It is the testimony of her life. Her husband has refused to heed the word very well. Let him be one without words. Okay? Show and tell the gospel as you submit to your husbands. Let's keep going here. Look at verses three and four with me. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. 
So again, Peter is addressing kind of these Roman household codes here in this text. Essentially, the way these household codes worked like this, women, your external beauty was everything in the Roman world. And back then, again, it obviously had to do with hairstyles and jewelry and makeup and clothing. And so let's say you get ready in the morning and you emerge from the bathroom. Your husband stands back, looks you up and down and says, don't like that. He, according to the household codes, now had permission to go into town square, find the most beautiful woman there, pursue her, woo her, commit adultery to her, with her, and then basically come home and tell you, you got to look better. Otherwise, I'm going to do that again. Okay, that, that is in the household codes. You can look that up. And there would be no consequence towards him. And Peter is essentially telling these wives here, don't get pulled into that nonsense. Don't get pulled into that. And guys, do we think we've progressed anywhere from that? It's all the same things listed here, hair and jewelry and makeup and clothing, all of those things. But because of so-called advances in technology, we've added a few more things on to that, haven't we? Like, don't you dare get cellulite. We're going to get that taken care of. Get wrinkles in your forehead as you age. We can make those go away. You got scars from childbirth. Ew, let's go ahead and get that taken care of. What Peter is saying, and women hear me, that is not how beauty is defined. And if we believe that beauty is defined purely externally, it is because we are far more influenced by the world than we are by the word. Katie reminded me this week, and I didn't know this, so it wasn't really a reminder, it was teaching. She says, most women are making themselves beautiful for other women, not for their husbands. Don't get pulled into that. That's crap. See, Peter's not saying here, eliminate pursuing beauty. I love the way Katie is put together. I love the way Katie takes care of herself, and I want to respond likewise. I want to make myself attractive to her. I don't love waking up at 5 a.m. and lifting weights, but Katie likes it when I lift weights, so I'm going to lift weights. <laughs> okay? But hear me. He is teaching ordered beauty. Ordered beauty. Spiritual beauty is primary. Physical beauty is a far down the list, secondary. And the older I get and the longer I've been married to Katie, the most attractive things about her are not her fading physical body, though I still love that. What is far more attractive to me is the beauty of the inner person of Katie Cunningham. When I do come in from that stupid workout and I see her there in my chair with her Bible and her discipleship journal and her prayer journal, that's attractive to me. When I get home from work and I see her on the couch with the kids in her lap, reading them the Bible or the catechism, that's attractive to me. When I have a hard day at work and she doesn't say, oh, let me, you know, just kind of like massage your ego, but she gives me the gospel, that's attractive to me. When she pushes us to practice hospitality, that's attractive to me. When, when I'm off in something and she corrects me with biblical knowledge, that's attractive to me, guys. Ordered beauty here. Yes, pursue physical beauty. As a matter of fact, 1 Timothy says this, have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths, these Roman household codes. Rather, train yourself for godliness, spiritual beauty. While bodily training or physical beauty is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and for the life to come. Ladies and, and men, how much time do you spend cultivating your physical beauty every day, and how does that compare to how much time you spend cultivating your spiritual beauty? Weigh those things. One will pass, and the other is imperishable. The cultivation of physical fruit is fleeting, but spiritual fruit, like what Peter mentions here, gentleness and a quiet spirit or meekness, these are enduring, okay? This, this is not telling women, sit down and shut up. This is just Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit, gentleness and meekness. We should all be growing. Character matters. We should all be growing to look more like Jesus, and Peter is particularly addressing the women here, saying, is physical beauty primary or is spiritual beauty primary? How are these things ordered in your life? 
Next, look at verses five and six with me. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Okay, so Peter is exhorting women, cultivate inner beauty, and he assures them this is a proven path down through history. And he gives the example of Sarah, And with with this statement, Peter is repeating that godly women should pursue spiritual beauty and submit to their husbands. But he also adds that while they may be exiled from their culture of origin, they now belong to a new family. They are daughters of Sarah, just as men are sons of Abraham. We are a part of a new faith family where the priorities are now righteousness and good deeds. And they need not fear any terrors, for they trust in God. And this sense of belonging is meant to encourage godly women in Peter's day, but perhaps this verse troubles the secular mind, or maybe it troubles godly women today. Maybe it troubles you. Maybe your husband or another man has acted sinfully or foolishly, so you hesitate to trust men, and you hesitate to trust your husband Or perhaps maybe you simply just want the freedom that is so highly valued in this age. Even in all of that, Peter not only commends submissiveness, but he also notes that Sarah obeyed Abraham and called him Lord. If wives balk at submission, how will they react to Sarah's example in church history? Calling a husband Lord seems heavy-handed, but lowercase Lord is not the same thing as uppercase Lord. In that culture, calling your husband Lord meant that a wife was simply acknowledging her husband with due deference, due respect as my husband and my leader. If you were to flip to Genesis 18, verse 22, you will see the one time Sarah calls Abraham Lord. And what happens here is Abraham uh, or Sarah recognizes Abraham's allegiance or uh, a leadership while speaking her mind to him, and then with God's blessing, Abraham listens to Sarah. That's in Genesis 21, 8 through 13. For the record, the official record, Katie has never called me Lord. Um, (laughs) There might be warrant for it now. Uh, (laughs) It's a joke, it's a joke, okay, it's a joke. I don't mean that. So this these six verses are just a little snapshot into how we can be counter, you can be countercultural wives in today's world. Let me sum this up. Submit to your husbands. Show and tell the gospel to your husbands. Have an ordered beauty in your own heart. Respect your husband and grow in the fruit of the spirit. None of that is condemning. None of that is harsh. None of that should be something we bristle at. Now, Peter has a word for husbands, countercultural husbands. Read verse 7 with me. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay, first, husbands, Peter says, live in an understanding way with your wives. This is the key that makes your leadership worth submission. Because that, tr- that phrase, understanding way, is literally translated as live according to knowledge. Do you know your wife? Do you know what makes her tick? Have you studied your wife? You want to know what makes my blood boil? When I'm in kind of a marriage counseling situation and the guy kind of jabs me and winks and says, well, women are crazy, can't understand them. Married men. You are not called to understand women, plural. You are called to understand women, singular. And some of you know everything there is to know about your favorite football team's backup or third-string quarterback. Man, what college did he go to? Uh, What high school did he go to? What day did his dog die in high school? What kind of food does he like? He was a vegan for six days, and then he tasted beef again and was like, oh, this is the way of the Lord. You know everything there is to know about that stuff, and then you sit there and say, I'm perplexed by one woman that I live with. Come on. 
You want to prop yourself up as the leader of the household? Then make yourself a man that is worth following by living according to the knowledge of your wife. Here's how you can do that. Know her moods, know her preferences, know her needs, and lay your life down to ensure that via your love and care she gets what God wants her to get. Know those things and lay your life down for that. When you get home from work, it's not an opportunity to sit down in the recliner with a Bud Light and wait for a sandwich. It is the second shift where you pour yourself out for your wife and children. Everyone thinks leadership is sexy till they're in it. Until you realize leadership is basically this, everyone ducks so I can be the one that gets punched in the face. Leadership, hear me men, is not doing what you want to do. Leadership is doing what you ought to do. In your marriage, men, you don't do what you want to do. You do what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is what God demands you to do in his scriptures. Lay your life down for the sake of your wives. Live according to knowledge of your wife in an understanding way. And, and then he says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Okay, I'll just be plain here. Okay, by and large, according to the scripture, according to history, according to science, women are generally physically weaker than men. Okay, Caitlin Clark is a generational basketball player. She's probably going to eventually go down as one of the best of all time in the WNBA. Caitlin Clark could not sniff a D1 roster for men's basketball. She may not even be able to make a men's varsity basketball team in high school. And I'm not saying that to dog Caitlin Clark. I'm saying that to say men and women are created differently in God's good design. And generally, women are physically weaker than men. Also, women are generally more vulnerable emotionally than men. I've heard it said this way. Women are Ferraris, men are Jeeps. Jeeps are rugged, and they're meant to take a hit. Ferraris, if it starts raining, you put that thing back in the garage. Women, especially in this day and age, were economically dependent upon their husbands. That's what the weaker vessel deal means. And Peter is saying, even if all of that is true, if women are generally physically and emotionally weaker than men, and they're dependent upon their husband, you... Honor her. Men, you never use your physical strength to lay hands on a woman. Never. Women, if you are in that situation in your home, discreetly let me know. We will do everything we can to get you to safety, and I will hopefully show enough restraint to not lay hands on that man myself. If you are a man and you are physically assaulting a woman, as clearly as I can say that, you're a coward. And you are a wimp. And you are weak. And what you are doing is evil. And God is very serious about protecting the vulnerable, especially his daughters. And God does not let evil go unpunished. So brother, if that's you, confess that sin and you accept the consequences of that sin as Jesus does his work in you over time. We don't use this weaker vessel thing as an excuse for abuse, men. Peter says, honor. Honor your wives. To honor your wives is to give credit where credit is due. You honor your wife spiritually by seeing them as co-heirs of God's grace. You honor your wife emotionally by understanding that God has wired her differently than you, and you see that as a good and a beautiful and a necessary thing. You honor your wife physically by never touching her in a harmful way that would hurt her, by never using your physical strength to overpower or intimidate. You honor your wife intellectually by realizing there are places where she is your intellectual superior, and you need to listen to her in that area. You honor your wife relationally by inviting her to bring every gift and every resource she has and marshal all of that to help you lead your home. You honor your wife financially when you trust her to be a good steward of the resources you both share. And if she is better at managing money than you, you delegate that to her to take charge of that in your home. Honor your wives. And listen, men, 
There is only one warning in this passage, and it's not directed towards women. It's directed towards men. Look at the end of verse 7. So that your prayers may not be hindered. Men, if you refuse to be a husband worth submitting to, your prayers will be hindered. There will be no cell service. If you do not treat your wives in a godly way, God's ears will be closed to you. Men, some of you are frustrated with the lack of growth in your marriage. You're frustrated with the lack of growth in your life. You're frustrated with the friction going on in your own soul. Hear me, maybe your prayers are hindered because you have not made yourself into a godly man we're submitting to. I told you this was countercultural. Some of us are wondering, men, why things aren't turning out in our lives. And you need to ask yourself the question, if you're married, am I caring for my wife in the way Christ cares for the church? These are countercultural wives, countercultural husbands. Now let's talk about some principles for countercultural marriages. Number one, first principle, whether a man or a woman, use your power to bless and serve, not to control. Within the marital union, both men and women have power. Okay, what power do women have? Uh, Now, I I realize this applies to both men and women, and within the marital bed, both men and women can be demanding and withholding of sex, okay? This happens, and we're meant to serve via sex, and we're meant to pursue uh, our husbands and wives that leads into intimacy. But generally speaking, women hold the power of beauty and sex over their husband. And it's not true that men only want one thing, but it's nearly true that men only want one thing. It is wrong to withhold your body to manipulate into getting your way. And again, this applies to both men and women. It is wrong, men, to withhold from your wife just to try and get your way. Paul says in 1 Corinthians that once we're married, we become one flesh and our bodies belong to the other and they're meant to be used to God's glory and service of our spouse. It is not okay to give your man the cold shoulder until you get your way. What power do men have? Generally speaking, physically. Women are the weaker vessels, what Peter says. So mainly, men have the power of physical power, but men also have the burden of leadership on their shoulders in the home. And we are meant to use that leadership to serve and to bless our wives and our children. C.S. Lewis says this, the crown a man wears in marriage is first a crown of thorns. (laughs) You are simply men and women trying not to get your way. You're not trying to... Uh, pacify your spouse by letting them get their way. You are both trying to get God's way in your marriage. You are meant with whatever power you have to bless and to serve and think about Jesus in the gospel, the all-powerful God of the universe, the second person of the Trinity. By the word of his power is all creation sustained and upheld. He is all-powerful, and yet he uses his power to bless and serve the fallen humans, the ones he created to love him and live righteously who rebelled against him. Even then, Jesus laid his power down. He humbled himself, is what Philippians 2 says, to the point of death, even death on a cross in our place. He didn't use his power to serve himself. He used his power to serve sinners like you and me. And if our marriages are a picture of Christ and the church, then whatever power we have, we lay it down, we humble ourselves, and we bless and serve our spouses. Second principle, in all things, all situations, press into the covenant. Friends, on that wedding day, whether in a courthouse or in a church or at a hotel or wherever they do them these days, a barn, um, hopefully you made a list of actual commitments to each other. We call these vows. These are covenants to one another, especially if you're Christians. And God does not want the covenant of your marriage broken. Yes, there are biblical cases for divorce, but where that standard is not met, we don't bounce because it gets hard. We press into the covenant we made. Katie and I are at 11 years, not long, but long enough 
that I've been married to a couple of iterations of Katie and she's been married to a couple iterations of Travis. And every time Katie changes, I don't get the opportunity to say, oh, there's my out. Every time I change, Katie doesn't have the opportunity to say, there's my out. You adapt to the change and you press into the covenant that you made. There are times where I make our marriage incredibly difficult. There are times where Katie makes our marriage incredibly difficult. And to be honest, there are times when you guys make my marriage incredibly difficult. (laughs) Difficulty is not reason to leave. Imagine if God recanted on his covenant promises to us when we got difficult. Imagine if God recanted on his covenant promises to us when we changed. But Jesus is God's very picture in the flesh of God's steadfast love and God's covenant commitment to us that before the foundation of the world, he said, those ones will be mine. And then we rebelled and he said, those ones are still mine. And then Jesus saved us and we didn't change all that much. And he said, those ones are still mine. And then we just keep on going one step forward, two steps back, failing forward. And yet God still says in Christ, those ones are mine and I have my steadfast love and commitment set upon them. Difficulty? Sure. Changes? Sure. Sinfulness? Sure. Him? Sure. He is faithful, eternally faithful, and he will not change. He keeps that covenant in all things he presses in. He will not break the covenant. And as people who picture the gospel in our marriages, we do not break the covenant. Finally, grace changes everything. We are co-heirs of grace, heirs of the grace of life together, which means we were saved by grace through faith in the first place, which means we stay saved by grace through faith, which means we will ultimately set our sights upon Jesus by grace through faith, which is a gift from God's hand to feeble people like us. So, What that does in our marriages is it makes room for our spouses to not be perfect. And it makes room for you to not be perfect. It makes room for us to be feeble and to fail at these things often. It makes room for, yes, us to be selfish and for us to sin against one another and for us to wound one another and for us to hurt one another. But it also makes even more space for God to enter into those things and say, I will heal that with my grace, by my power. We have to make room for that grace in our marriages. When your husband, when your wife sins against you, Don't turn your back and run. Yes, you can be hurt by that. But if they seek forgiveness, man, you extend that because you've been forgiven much in Jesus Christ. When things are at a stalemate in your marriage, don't sit back and get lazy. Pursue as the hound of heaven pursued us with his grace and his mercy. Grace changes everything. So... Those are just, that's it, three. I told you guys I'm not going 55 today. Three principles there for how we can have countercultural marriages. Use your power to bless and serve, not control. When things are hard, press into the covenant you made. And finally, allow grace to change everything. Let me conclude with a quote from John Piper. So I end with a reminder that marriage is not mainly about staying in love. It's about covenant keeping. And the main reason it's about covenant keeping is that God designed the relationship between a husband and his wife to represent the relationship between Christ and the church. This is the deepest meaning of marriage. And this is why ultimately the roles of headship and submission are so important. If our marriages are going to tell the truth about Christ and his church, we cannot be indifferent to the meaning of headship and submission. And let it not go without saying that God's purpose for the church and for the Christian wife who represents it is her everlasting holy joy. Christ died for them to bring that about. Did you hear that? If we are countercultural wives, if we are countercultural husbands, if we pursue countercultural marriages, it results in our everlasting joy. 
This is not a passage meant to beat down. This is a passage meant to lift up and give joy as we gladly submit to God's word as the authority in our lives. So, I don't know where you find yourself today. Um, I know where I found myself this week. I found myself this week under some heavy conviction from the Lord because there are many areas in my marriage where I have not made myself into a leader worth submitting to. And, And here's what God does with conviction. God doesn't use conviction to say condemned away from me. God uses conviction by his spirit's power to say, come on, come on, confess that, find freedom, find joy, find change. So, so then I go to Katie, and I'm like, hey, there's these, some of these things I just need to work through with you. I need to talk with you about. And guess what she does? Grace upon grace upon grace. And so if you're feeling convicted, whether a husband or a wife, This is not meant to condemn. This is meant, like all of God's word, to convict, which leads to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And in that, in the conviction, bring it to Jesus. Bring it to Jesus. Confess those things to the Lord. Ask him to change you in those things. Bring it to your husband. Bring it to your wife. Ask for their forgiveness. Ask for their help to change in these ways. Bring it to our prayer team up front. Bring it to your community. If you're in a home group, bring it to the elder. Bring it to whoever. There's freedom in confession. And for the Christian, on the back end of confession is always assurance of faith. There is always assurance of mercy, always assurance of grace, always assurance of forgiveness, always assurance of God's power to change. Are you convinced God can bring about that change in your life and in your marriage? That shows how much you actually believe in the good news of the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we, we do thank you for Jesus the one who left heaven's throne to pursue his bride, who laid everything down, his life, his breath, and his blood for the sake of his bride. I pray for the husbands in our church, God, that they would become men like Jesus, who gladly lay down their breath and their life and their blood for the sake of their wives and their homes. I pray you would make us as men into leaders worth following, so believing in the gospel and saturated in the gospel and adorning the gospel that our homes are places of joy and hope and peace and love. I pray for the women in the room who are married, Lord. Would you make them uh, into women who continue to grow in the fruit of the Spirit, who are countercultural wives, who both show and tell the gospel within their marriage, And as they do that, both their husband and their home would flourish. And in all things, would we remember, God, that we are the bride, Jesus is the groom, and we are called to submit to him and to his word in all things. And so, God, where we're off, would you convict us and draw us back to yourself and draw us back to obedience, which always leads to joy. I pray for those who don't know you, God, would you draw them to yourself and give them the gift of grace and faith this morning. Pray all this in Christ's name, amen.